Every year in October, the Karolinska Institute in Sweden announces the winners of the Nobel Prize. Every day you wake up and there's one more prize announced. Physics, economics, literature, peace, chemistry. This is widely known. Everyone pays attention to that. What is less known is that a few weeks before that, they announced the Ig Nobel Award. If you've ever heard of that, the Ig Nobel Award is an award given to scientists who've been doing research that was actually peer-reviewed and published in journals that is utterly stupid. <laughs> the research that they uh, won this year uh, was a research done by a group uh, in, in, in neurophysiology that showed that, uh, in fact, the contagious yawn, you know, this thing when if I yawn, then someone else starts yawning, it doesn't happen, as it turns out, with the red foot tortoise. They tried it and it doesn't happen. Uh, a few years ago, the, the uh, MIT group tested uh, formally the five seconds rule and it proved that if you drop something on the floor and you eat it really quickly, it's still as contaminated as it, it was after uh, one second. Uh, the, the literature award uh, was given two years ago to the uh, Ireland police because they awarded the, this one guy with uh, 50 traffic tickets just because his name was Bravo Yazdi, which is traffic ticket in Polish. Uh, <laughs> and they, they go on and on. Well, as it turns out, I was a nominee for the award <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, the story goes this way. Uh, I was working at the time in a company that I was the founder of. It was a security company, and this is a nice way to say that we were hackers. <laughs> we would break into banks and financial institutes, try to kind of sneak in and see if there's a way to steal money from the, the banks or change records of, of the FBI's and state systems, do all kinds of nasty things. And then we could do that. We would go to them and say, you know, we were able to sneak into your bank and change your, your records and steal some money. Why don't you hire us now? and let us help you do a better job in securing yourself from the other bad guys. This is what we termed active marketing. <laughs> uh, and usually they would either hire us or we would have to confront the law again. Uh, so this went uh, pretty well for a while, and the particular uh, time that got me this recognition was when we were working on, uh, legitimately this time, for the social security services. So they have this big database that has all of your records. It has your first name, last name, uh, date of birth, marital status for each and every person in the system. And a lot of systems kind of read this to, to determine who you are. And we were asked by them if we could somehow try to sneak in and change records and delete things and basically get access to something that is very private. And we were doing that for a few days, and it took us very little time to do everything we wanted. We could go in, we could change things, we could do whatever we wanted. We were very proud of ourselves. And then the way it goes is that uh, one of the team has to write a report explaining how it's done and kind of in detail and demonstrating how it's done. And I assigned one of my team members, Nathan, to do that. And I went home for the weekend, and his job was to kind of do this thing and, and send it to the social security services, showing them how it can be done. This is great. On Monday morning, before I go to work, I decided to stop at the bank to get money from the teller. This is 2000, so it's uh, still, you go inside to do that. And I'm standing in line, and I go to the teller, and I gave her my ATM card, and she starts typing things, and then she's turning white. And she says, just a second, I'm gonna I need to clarify something. And she goes to the other room, and I see her talking to the manager for a few seconds, and he's becoming pretty uh, nervous, and he approaches me, and he says, uh, could you step with me to the other room for a second? And I say, sure, what's the problem? He says, well, there's a problem with, your, uh, uh, with uh, giving you money since the system says that you're dead. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, uh, this is, you know, it particularly it was concerning because the guy, the manager, was Yoni Peltzman, a friend of mine, who spent the weekend with me. So he should know that I'm alive. <laughs> and, uh, and I say, no, this is, w what's the story? Turns out that here's what's happened. Nathan wanted to demonstrate that we could actually change records in a database. So he chose one record of a person he knew well and changed his entry from being alive to being dead. There's one flag for every person that says that you're alive, and he just uh, changed that. It's like a binary flag from zero to one, and from then on, I was uh, formally dead. <laughs> now, um, there's a few kind of problems with being dead, as you can imagine. Uh, um, the particular problem that came, came about really quickly is that uh, uh, you can't change it back. So no programmer has ever thought about the idea that someone's gonna, you know, aside of Jesus, Elvis, and maybe Paul McCartney, if you believe in conspiracy theories, most people who die don't get back to life. So no one thought that they're gonna have to actually have this program change it back. And also a lot of systems read this information and they don't check again. They assume that if you're dead, you're dead. So uh, I was dead. And there was no way to go back to life. 
And uh, you know, my parents started getting letters from insurance companies offering them benefits, uh, flower bouquets from all kinds of, you know, with the kind of this generic uh, sorry for your loss uh, thing. And, and this was starting to spiral. Uh, there was also some good things about it. All my all my traffic tickets were cancelled. <laughs> um, one time I was stopped by a police officer, and you can imagine his look on his face when he sees that I'm uh, actually. Uh, uh, declared dead when he's not trained to deal with zombies in his profession. <laughs> so, he, um, by the way, I'm alive. If there was, if there was, a cons if there was no, <laughs> it wasn't clear, no need to gen sticks or wooden or, or onion uh, bracelets or something. I'm alive. My doctor said so. Um, aside of color blindness, I'm perfect. <laughs> so, um, so there were a lot of problems with uh, taking the GREs at the time, a lot of things that I had to deal with. But the main problem uh, started when I learned that uh, someone in our family actually died. So at a particular time, I was just sitting, uh, resting in peace, as they say, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place when I got two consecutive phone calls, one after the other. The first one was from this person in India uh, who was the head of an organization called uh, In Memory Of. And he said that he wanted me to be involved in this organization. And what happens is that in India, there's a lot of districts, and a lot of districts that have their own kind of system for, for a, kind of collecting people information. And there's a phenomenon that is pretty prevalent there, where family members who want to take over your land go and declare you dead. And then basically there's no way to, to come back to life. And he basically formed this big organization called In Memory Of, where he collected all the zombies in the world and try to help them get recognition. He would he himself try to run for office, although he was dead. He got married, although he was dead. He was arrested a few times. His wife tried to claim a widow uh, welfare uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, he was trying to do a lot of things to kind of prove that you can that he's alive. Although his uncle declared him dead to take over the family land, failed. But when he heard about a story that they uh, had about me, this like a newspaper uh, column about me that said the life and death and life again of Moran Cerf. He knew that someone in the Western world is sharing the same problem. So he contacted me and said, would you be our spokesperson in the Western world so we can kind of, uh, you know, because in India it's a pretty, it's a pretty thing, but, but no one else knows about that. And ultimately this is what got them to be candidates for the uh, Ig Nobel Award when they actually had this, this thing. But what was troubling was that one morning I got a call from my cousin telling me that my other cousin, her brother, is actually dead, and we had to deal with that. So our family is pretty divided. There is about 50 people in our family, but my immediate family, the four nuclear uh, uh, members of my family, my dad, my mom, my younger brother, myself, we are isolated. And that is because we're not religious. So our family is very religious. My dad has eight siblings, and they're all uh, Orthodox Jews. And because we're not observing the way they are, we were basically scrutinized out of the family. We were not invited to things there. My dad also made this worst thing of marrying my mom, who is a devout atheist. Uh, and, and she kind of uh, kept referring to God as an imaginary friend to just annoy them. <laughs> so the, our family pretty much collapsed, particularly the event that kind of uh, broke everything apart was this uh, uh, one event where my uh, younger cousin uh, had his bar mitzvah. So in Jews, uh, in Jewish families, there's a, a kind of uh, the head of the family, if you want, is, is the male member. And my grandfather had many uh, uh, grandkids, but among them, there's only two male, myself and my younger cousin. And since I was secular, I wasn't allowed to be kind of the head of the family, if you, if you may. And when he had his bar mitzvah, we were all invited to this big event. But the thing is, my uncle called us and had very strict uh, directions, instructions. You can come to the bar mitzvah if you agree to not drive on Saturday, which is unallowed. You have to arrive on Friday, and you have to sleep in sleeping bags in our place so we would see that you're not driving. <laughs> Imagine how my mom responded to that. She used the, the equivalent of uh, F word and C word in Hebrew. And she said, absolutely not. And my dad basically tried to kind of reconcile things between his family and my mom. And basically, he gathered us once, one day for dinner and said, look, there's a bar mitzvah happening in Jerusalem. We have to drive there. We're not allowed to drive there. We're going to do the following. We are going to lie. <laughs> now, most kids have their parents tell them not to lie. And we were sitting with my dad and my mom, practicing how to lie. Like saying, if you get asked that, what are you saying? If you get asked that, if you, if you are uh, separate, what are you? So we were practicing for this lie. And it turns out that we didn't do a good job, because when we got there, we were immediately separated and interrogated, and this was, like a, this was like a prisoner's dilemma. Do I sacrifice my brother? Like, what is he saying in the other room? My mom had this uh, sophist choice, he had to choose between the two brothers. We failed totally. And before long, the entire family was in a big fight about the fact that we were trying to lie and drive on Saturday. 
and and I, it's it's kind of funny now, but at the time it was pretty horrific. We were sitting in in the room, all of the cousins, all of the kids, listening to our parents fighting each other. And I remember we were trying to kind of, I was the oldest, and I was trying to kind of, you know, make people uh, uh, talk and, and be friendly. And I was looking at the youngest cousin, she was five years old, and I asked her, so uh, tell me about yourself. And I, I didn't know her. And she showed me a little picture on her wall where she drew all of the family. And there were 46 people there. <laughs> we were not there. <laughs> and I asked the Ruth, you know, we're cousins. How come I'm not part of the picture you drew of the entire family? Everyone is there. And she says, well, dad says that you're not really a part of the family. And I said, why is that? She says, because you don't believe in God, and it means that you're not really part of us. And I said, you know, there's, God is something you believe in, like unicorns, like, like uh, other things. Like, it's not something that you, I mean, we're still cousins. Like, if you need a kidney, I'm still going to be the one to ask for a kidney. Uh, it didn't really matter to her, and, and luckily, uh, her, my parents stopped us before I had to explain to her why Santa Claus doesn't exist, and so, so the tooth fairy. <laughs> and we drove home, all of us in the car, uh, and it was clear at the time that this is going to be the last time I see all of my cousins because the one time we were actually trying to regroup, it was a such a disaster that the family basically separated. So for five years, I didn't hear anything from this part of my family. It was just the four of us. Until the day I was dead, when I got a call that Nadav, my cousin whose bar mitzvah it was at the time, turned 18 by then, went to the army and was killed in a suicide bombing when he was on his way home. So now we hear this thing, and my cousin calls and she says, we have the funeral tomorrow, I want you and your family to be with us for the funeral. And on the one hand, up to now, I was pretty amused by all this death thing, but now it's a serious one that we have to deal with, so I had to kind of hide that. And all of us went as a family to the funeral. There were a thousand people there. All of them came because of, of the family death, and they were not familiar to me. I didn't know who, who they were. So me and my family, we stood in like line 40, somewhere there, just kind of behind us, when suddenly the little cousin, Ruth, who by now was 10, came and grabbed me and said, hey, why don't you stand with us, with the family? And she dragged us, and we went to stand together with all of our family for the funeral. And then we went to their house for the Shiva afterwards. And I could see that on the picture, on her wall, there were now 50 people including four additional circles with a little corn, unicorn, <laughs> uh, for us. And I kept this picture. It had a little witty sentence that she wrote uh, that I, for me is uh, the only memory I have of my little cousin that I barely got to know. That month they brought me back to life. A judge had a court order announced that I'm alive again and they put a new entry in the records for me. Now I have two entries, which still causes some confusions again and again when there's problems. And the In Memory organization went to win the Ig Nobel Award a year after. I was no longer part of it because I was alive, unfortunately. And the only thing I have now is this picture in memory of my cousin with a sentence that says, you should always start to be yourself unless you can be a unicorn, in which case you should always start to be a unicorn. <laughs> Thank you.